there are a number of questions and concerns regarding the vaccines available for COVID-19. And also there is a great deal of anxiety about the variants of COVID-19 that have emerged recently. We have interviewed Dr. Caitlin Malarkey to address some of the most frequently asked questions about the vaccines available and the variants of SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Malarkey is a Rhodes Scholar and has received her PhD from the Oxford University. She is an immunologist and a virologist with an extensive knowledge and expertise in infectious disease and vaccine development. With that being said, we hope you enjoy our conversation with Dr. Malarkey. This interview took place on February 26, 2021, and therefore the information may be subject to change after this date. The information in this interview is not intended to be substituted for professional medical advice regarding the COVID-19 vaccines. Please consult with a physician or other healthcare providers with any questions regarding the vaccination. So we are seeing a number of vaccines getting approved for COVID-19 that utilize a number of different technologies. Can you explain the basic mechanism of action of some of these vaccine platforms, such as the mRNA platform that is used in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, and also the viral vector platform that is utilized in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Sure, absolutely. Happy to explain the differences in how those vaccines actually achieve protection. And, and maybe I'll just take, take a step back and, and talk about you know, how a vaccine works in general. So uh, the best way to think about a vaccine is that it's a rehearsal for your immune system. So you train your immune system with a bit of the pathogen so that when you actually encounter it later on, you're all well poised to fight off that infection. Okay, so, and, and vaccines work by leveraging how our immune system works, which is that the second time you see a pathogen, you respond much more quickly and the so the magnitude of the response is greater and also the quality of the response is greater. So a vaccine is giving your body a little taste of the pathogen at first. So if you actually see it later on, you're ready to fight it off. So both of these technologies will do that, but they, they achieve the protection in different ways. So let's start with the mRNA vaccine. So that's a, a newly licensed vaccine platform. And mRNA is just nucleic acid. Okay, so it's just a piece of nucleic acid. In this case, the nucleic acid happens to encode for the glycoprotein on the outside of the virus. So these, this mRNA is delivered in a liposome vehicle. So when you receive it in your arm, the liposome can fuse with your cells and deliver the nucleic acid into the cytoplasm, right? Because it's mRNA, it can be translated then by our ribosomes. So what this technology is doing is it, it makes your cell make a part of the viral pathogen. Okay, so it makes this S protein and then it presents it to the immune system so you can develop an immune response. Importantly though, it's only a piece of the pathogen, right? It's not the entire pathogen. So it can't cause disease or all of the other severe outcomes that we associate with um, infection with SARS-CoV-2. Now, the viral vector vaccines also deliver a piece of the pathogen, but how they deliver that piece of the pathogen is a little bit different. So with a viral vector vaccine, we're actually using another virus to deliver a piece of the um, virus itself, which again is the SARS-CoV-2 glycoprotein. So viruses have evolved to infect your cells and express protein. So we can modify viruses. We can use safe surrogates to then deliver certain antigens that we want to elicit an immune response against. So in the case of the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, those specifically use adenoviral vectors. Um, in the case of the AstraZeneca vaccine, it's an adenovirus from a chimpanzee, and it's been modified so that it can't actually replicate. So you get the, vi you get the vaccine, it's got the virus. The virus has encoded in it this particular antigen, this S antigen. The adenovirus infects your cells, it expresses that S protein, right? That your cells express that S protein. And then again, they can mount an immune response. Again, the virus, the viral vector itself has been modified. So it can't continue to replicate. It can only get into your cells and make this protein. And then eventually your immune system will clear that particular viral vector as well. That's really fascinating that we have all these technologies. And I think the COVID infection and the whole pandemic helped us develop a bunch of new technologies and actually utilize them. 
I, I agree. That, I definitely think the pandemic has has spurned a lot of innovation. It's absolutely exciting, which actually leads us to the second question. So can you give us some insight into how an approved vaccine was produced in under a year? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's very, it's incredible, really, that we have a licensed, many, more than one, licensed vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 when we really only knew about this pathogen in late December of, of 2019, early January 2020. Um, and usually the traditional pipeline to, ha- to vaccine licensure would take a decade or even longer. Um, and in so- there's many viruses that we can point to that have we've discovered they've caused pandemics and we still don't have a vaccine, a licensed vaccine. SARS-CoV-1 is an example. MERS is also an example. And those are also related coronaviruses. Um, so the fact that we have many vaccines to choose from now um, is, is truly um, you know, something to be marveled at. So there's at least three reasons that, that explain how we were able to accelerate the licensure of these vaccines. And I, and I like to use the word accelerate. I think rushed implies things were done maybe a little sloppily, and that certainly wasn't the case here. So there were no standards that were lowered in order to license these vaccines, but we were able to speed along the process, and that happened in a few ways. Um, In the first instance, one, one factor that allowed us to get these vaccines up and running so quickly is that we had really good preclinical information from the related coronaviruses that I mentioned before. So we had information from preclinical work done on SARS-CoV-1 and Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, MERS, um, that allowed us to understand what a good target could be and what the outcome of a particular platform could be, right? So because that work had already been done, we had a really, we had a head start really on where to look Um, for SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development. In some cases, there were already phase one studies done with the particular um, vaccine platform. Okay, so for instance, in the case of the AstraZeneca vaccine, in April of 2020, they published a phase one study of their vaccine platform. The difference was instead of the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2, they used the spike protein of MERS. So we could already look and say, look, here's a vaccine platform for a very similar virus. And we already know what the safety and immunogenicity results are there. And so that helped helped us get started um, developing the particular formulations and design of those vaccines. The second factor I'm gonna point to is how the clinical trials were actually executed. So typically in in a traditional vaccine pipeline, you start with your preclinical models. Okay, so these are, these are in vitro studies, studies in animal models. Um, and if you had good, have good evidence that that, that works, you can file um, for a new investigational drug and then get, get this uh, strategy into humans. And once it's in humans, there's three phases of trials. So phase one is purely safety and immunogenicity. We don't even look at if the vaccine works. We just say, is it safe? And does it elicit the immune response that that we're trying to elicit? Phase two also primarily is focused on safety and immunogenicity, but we use more people. Essentially, we we, we enroll more individuals. We start small and and, uh, very focused. And then as we move along in the trials, they get bigger and bigger and bigger so that they're powered enough to give us um, so we can make meaningful conclusions from the data. Then we move into phase three studies, and that actually looks at the efficacy. Okay, so does it actually work? Does it it prevent severe disease? Does it prevent you from getting infected? Does it prevent people from dying? And if all of that information looks good, then it's reviewed by the governing agencies in in whatever country you're in um, for approval. Okay, so it has to go through all three phases, and then governing bodies need to approve it. So usually these clinical trial phases would happen linearly. So you'd have phase one, you'd complete your phase one study, you take some time to analyze the data that may take a year or two, and then if everything looks good, you would go on and you'd start the phase two study. So in in the case of SARS-CoV-2, what we started to do is actually overlap the trials. 
So instead of waiting completely until the phase one studies were done, we started the phase one studies, we tested them in a certain number of individuals, we did an interim analysis of the data and the safety. And if the interim analysis looked all good, then we started the, the next phase, okay? So instead of, of one after the other after the other, we started to overlap the trials, which allowed us to get through those three phases more quickly. So some of the, the licensure was based on phase three studies um, that enrolled tens of thousands of participants from all over the globe, but they weren't, they weren't done yet. And in some cases they're still going on. Okay, so that's the second reason, these overlapping clinical trials. And then the third reason, which is also really important is, uh, vaccine manufacturers like Pfizer, like Moderna, like AstraZeneca, they actually started to make the vaccine before it was approved. Okay, so typically these manufacturers would not even, you know, wouldn't take on the financial risk of making a vaccine that wasn't approved, right? They're, they're spending millions of dollars making this vaccine, but if it's never approved, that's all going to be for naught. Uh, in this case, they actually started to make the vaccine before it was approved. So they, they started production at risk. But then what that allowed is once it was licensed, we immediately had vaccine available to be shipped. Okay, so those are the three primary reasons that I, uh, that I can point to to say why that pipeline has been accelerated. Good preclinical data, overlapping clinical trials, um, and vaccine production at risk. No safety standards were lowered um, during that entire pipeline. Okay, so we didn't say it wasn't acceptable to any governing agency that, that the same safety criteria that would need to be met for any other vaccine, um, we didn't lower those in any way. We still had to meet those robust criteria um, for licensure to happen. And, and there was obviously you know, good impetus for these, given the, the huge urgent global need, good impetus for these governing bodies to, to review information promptly. Okay, so in, in other situations where non-pandemic situations, um, you know, there wouldn't be the same time pressure. Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. I think um, putting it into perspective, it will hopefully um, help a lot of the general public just to make a decision on whether or not they will uh, receive the vaccine themselves. I guess with um, an extension to that question, can you tell us a little bit about the demographics included in the clinical trials conducted so far for the approved vaccines? Sure, right. So typically with clinical trials, the first population that we test them in is healthy adults. Okay, so people between 18 and 65 that are otherwise don't really have any pre-existing conditions or, or comorbidities. And, and again, that's for safety reasons, right? We want to make sure that we're testing these, um, these testing these interventions in, in patients that have that are low risk to begin with, right? Unfortunately, that means that, that in the, some of these large phase three studies, some populations were excluded. And, and a notable population here that, that um, has been a topic of great discussion recently is pregnant and lactating women. Okay, so pregnant and lactating women were not included in these phase three studies. So is, is the vaccine safe to get, okay? The first, the first disclaimer here I'm gonna give is I, I am not a medical doctor. I am not giving out medical advice here, but I am well poised to speak about the data and also what, what the external um, bodies are recommending. Okay, so the official recommendation for pregnant women is that they should discuss this with their doctor and make an informed decision um, based on those conversations with their healthcare provider. The, there are organizations um, such as the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, and also the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists um, that recommend that COVID-19 vaccines not be withheld from pregnant or lactating women, okay? So essentially, um, if they want them and they have a conversation with their healthcare provider and decide that that is, is the right choice for them, that they should be given those vaccines. And there are some important risks to weigh, at, weigh here, right? So we know that, that there isn't any safety or efficacy data right now for pregnant and lactating women. 
But you have to balance that with the fact that there is data from Canada and internationally that pregnant women are at higher risk for severe outcomes for COVID-19. Um, so those need to be carefully weighed by the individual and the healthcare provider. Um, what is good to note is that uh, Pfizer has recently launched a clinical trial to test their vaccine in pregnant women. So this is a phase two, three trial that will enroll 4,000 pregnant women. Um, so we should have more information soon or you know, reasonably soon uh, about the safety in this particular demographic. Okay, thank you so much um, for that answer. Um, now for our next question, if someone has already had COVID, do they need to get vaccinated? Yeah, good question. And, and certainly another, another hot topic for discussion. Um, so the, the first thing I'll say is um, all the licensed vaccines now work on a two shot schedule. So, and, and we call those two shots. The first one, we call it the prime and the second one, we call it the boost. So you would need to, you need to get two shots to be fully or to achieve the efficacy that has been shown in, in the clinical trials for each of those three vaccines. So wh what if you have had COVID? What does that mean for your protection status? Um, the short answer is we don't know yet, right? The, there is no correlate of protection for SARS-CoV-2 yet. And, and what that means is we don't know yet what antibody levels you need to achieve in order to be protected. Okay. So you might have some antibodies, but do you have enough antibodies? And does that response decrease over time? And how quickly does it decrease over time? We don't have answers to these questions yet. And, and we will, as we um, are able to monitor individuals who have been infected and vaccinated longitudinally, so over long periods of time. So if you have had a SARS-CoV-2 infection, and you know that because you've been tested and you came back positive, um, do you need to get vaccinated? I think the, the, so you can think of the infection in this case as, as the prime, right? And so it is a good idea to still get boosted um, because even if you have antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, if you get a vaccine, it's going to boost those levels even more. Um, there's some preliminary evidence um, done by a group in New York out of Mount Sinai Hospital um, that shows that individuals who are infected probably only need one vaccine dose instead of two because they've already had that experience with the antigen. Their body has already formed an immune response. So in these specific cases, we may only need to give one shot instead of two. Um, and, and again, what that study showed is that the antibody levels that you achieve with just one dose are the same as people that have had two doses. Um, so if you've, if you've ha already had COVID, um, it's a good idea to still get vaccinated just to ensure uh, that you're boosting your immune response and um, increasing the chance that should you encounter that particular pathogen, you'll be protected. Thank you so much. I think it's very important that the general public knows that so they don't like make any assumptions and ensure their safety. So that leads us to our next question. Can you please explain the COVID variants? Mm -hmm. Again, another hot topic um, that is getting um, a lot of attention uh, globally, right? So the thing we have to keep in mind for viruses is that viruses are always changing and they are always mutating. So the fact that this particular virus is doing that is actually what we should expect. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't be worried about it, but all viruses do that. All viruses are going to make mistakes when they replicate. Those mistakes will introduce mutations and mutations are what drive evolution. So when we talk about viruses, viruses replicate using nucleic acid polymerases and all nucleic acid polymerases make mistakes even the ones in our own cells. And when they make these mistakes, again, this introduces mutations. Sometimes those mutations actually have phenotypic consequences, all right? So they change the way the virus behaves. Um, a lot of times they don't actually, uh, but obviously we're concerned with the cases where there are mutations that then have phenotypic consequences particularly around things like transmissibility or pathogenicity, 
different. So what are the SARS-CoV-2 variants? The SARS-CoV-2 variants are um, viruses that have changes from the original virus that came out of Wuhan that we first knew about in January of, of 2020. So they have changes um, throughout their genome, mutations in their genome. And the ones that we're particularly concerned about are the mutations in the spike protein. Okay, so right now there are three variants. Um, they are the UK variant, which is the B117 variant, the South African variant, which is the B1351 variant, and the Brazil variant, which is the P1 variant. Okay? So all of these variants have small changes in their amino acid sequence, the, the genome of that particular virus. They, these three variants tend to share, a, they do share a common mutation at a certain position um, in the spike protein. Now, why do we care about that? So with these particular changes in the genome, it does seem to have phenotypic consequences um, of particular concern is increased transmissibility. So these, these particular variants seem to transmit at a higher rate. Whether or not they, they cause more morbidity, I think is, is still a little controversial. I don't know if we have the data yet to say that conclusively. There have been some suggestions in the UK that that's the case, um, but I don't know if we have the data to, to fully support that. As SARS-CoV-2 spreads and we continue to have lots of cases globally, the virus is going to continue to change. It's going to continue to mutate. Again, a lot of times that really won't have, um, it won't make the virus more dangerous. Sometimes it can even make the virus less dangerous. Um, but in certain cases, it might, which should be reassuring based on the evidence that we have so far is that SARS-CoV-2 actually does not mutate as quickly as some other viruses that we know about. Okay, so for our, by our best estimates, uh, the virus replicates at about half the rate of influenza and a quarter of the rate of HIV. Okay, so yes, it's mutating. It's not mutating as quickly as some other viruses that we know about. Um, and can we expect it to continue to mutate? Yes. Um, again, whether or not that, uh, you know, whether those mutations will be problematic um, will remain to be seen. Okay, thank you. That really clears things up about the variants. Um, that leads us to our last and final question. Do vaccines cover the different variants? Yes, this is, this is a, a nuanced question. And actually it's something that we're still learning about in real time. So the short answer is that it depends. It depends on what vaccine you're talking about and what variant you're talking about. Um, because again, the variants, while they have some similarities, there are differences between them, um, in, again, in the amino acid sequence of, of the virus. Um, so what the data suggests so far is that there does seem to be a reduction um, in the ability of antibodies induced by vaccines to neutralize the virus. Okay. So it does seem that they work less well how much less? Again, it, it depends on the vaccine and it depends on the variant. Um, and, and another thing that we need to keep in mind when we talk about vaccine mediated immunity, vaccine induced protection is that there are, there's actually a lot of different ways vaccines can achieve protection, right? The, the easiest way, and I think the way that most of us think about is completely stopping you from getting infected in the first place. Okay, and that's something that we call sterilizing immunity. And I think that that's the optimal result for a vaccine is if it can stop you from getting protected in the first place. But another really important aspect of vaccine mediated immunity is that it, they can protect against severe disease. So even if you do get infected, you never get sick enough to be hospitalized, to be mechanically ventilated, um, which is really what's causing a, a huge burden on healthcare systems globally is the fact that patients come in needing um, either supplemental oxygen or mechanical ventilation. It's filling up ICU beds. You know, resources have to be diverted from other aspects of healthcare. Okay, so even if a vaccine can't completely stop you from being infected, 
there is a really important benefit of preventing against severe disease. Okay, so, and, and that I think is getting lost a little in the vaccine messaging. Everyone's really focused on what, what, what is the efficacy against mild or moderate disease, which is basically if you stop, if it stops you from getting infected in the first place. So we know, for instance, that with the mRNA vaccines, that's north of 90%. For some of the other vaccines, some of the adenoviral vectored vaccines like AstraZeneca or the Johnson Johnson, it's lower, right? It's, it's maybe 60 or 70% depending on the vaccine and depending on the dose. But what's really important is that all of those vaccines have really, really high rates of protection against severe disease. So yes, you might get infected, but it's going to keep you out of the hospital, right? And, and that's also a huge aspect of vaccine-mediated immunity that we can't ignore. So to, to kind of circle back to the original question, yes, it does seem that, that there is reduced protection um, against the variant strains. Hard to say, again, how much, and that will depend on if it's the mRNA vaccine, if it's the B117 variant, if it's the P1 variant. Um, but again, these vaccines are, are still good at protecting against severe disease, right? So, and, and I think that question will be really important because as the vaccines are rolled out, some people might be tempted to hold off to get the better vaccine, right? I don't want the vaccine that only has 70% efficacy. I don't, I want the one that has 95% efficacy. Um, and, and that sort of misses the point. All of these vaccines um, are going to have a protective effect that is going to keep you from experiencing severe disease. And the more individuals that we vaccinate, um, the quicker we will achieve herd immunity and really start to stem the spread of vaccination. So I always tell people that they should get the vaccine um, that is offered to them. Of course, if it if it's been um, if there's no contraindications based on their their medical history, and and that's what's you know that's going to again get us back to quote unquote normal life. So another question we had was, what are the long term side effects of some of these vaccines? And that's a good question, and it's certainly a question on, on people's minds, especially with the mRNA vaccines, which is a newly licensed vaccine platform. Um, now, the first thing to keep in mind with any medical intervention, whether that is a vaccination or you know, surgery or even taking a drug, um, there are always risks involved. Okay? There, there is no medical intervention that is 100% safe. All medical interventions carry a certain level of risk. Um, but what you know by engaging in them we we acknowledge that the relative risk is is you know on balance um much less than whatever the outcome of not receiving that medical intervention okay so that's just a, a long-winded way of saying that that everything carries a risk and we need to think carefully about relative risk and and you know even if we take that more that concept more generally, there's no activity that we do that's completely free of risk. Even if we get in the car uh, and drive to the grocery store, there's some inherent risk in that. But we deem the inherent risk of potentially being in a car accident to be, you know, acceptable. Um, and so it, you know, this is the same idea with, with all vaccines and medical interventions. Everything carries a risk, um, but vaccine-related uh, adverse events are exceptionally low. Um, and just to give some, um, you know, ballpark numbers, one one particular adverse event that that people are concerned about are um, allergies or anaphylactic reactions that happen as a result of getting a vaccine. Um, and we have seen some anaphylactic reactions um, to SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, but of 18 million doses administered, only 66 allergic reactions have happened, okay? So 66 out of 8 million, that's a really, really low relative risk. So is it possible you could experience anaphylaxis from getting the vaccine? Yes. Is it likely? Not really. And I'll also point out that of those individuals that experience anaphylaxis, um, none of those individuals succumbed to the anaphylaxis. So they were all treated um, appropriately and there, there were no deaths. So when we talk about long-term risks for vaccines, these, there, and there are some, um, there, are, there can be some immune-mediated reactions that, that happen, um, 
these usually appear within six weeks of getting the vaccine. Okay, so these aren't things that show up a year later or 10 years later or 20 years later. They usually show up within weeks to months of receiving the vaccine. So we should be picking these up in the phase three clinical studies and, and we continue to monitor vaccines even after they're licensed. Okay, and that's, that's kind of phase four of um, you know, this, this clinical trial. There is post licensure surveillance data that is collected for exactly this reason, so that we can continue to monitor any adverse events that weren't picked up by the phase three clinical trials. So, in, so for these SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, the, the risk of long-term effects is really negligible. We would have seen that in the data already. Um, and for these mRNA vaccines, you know, the, the mechanisms by which they work, it, it's hard to imagine what potential long-term side effects um, could be induced by them. mRNA has a half-life of, of hours um, and it doesn't kick around in your cell for, forever. And, you know, it's mRNA, it's not DNA. Um, they're, you know, it's not integrating into your genomic material. Um, so the, the long-term events of these um, are, are very unlikely. Thank you so much um, for speaking with us today and answering all of our questions. I know it definitely enlightened me on a lot of these different nuances surrounding like the vaccine. And I hope that everybody else who's watching this video also had some of their questions answered as well as they're feeling a little bit more safe or secure with their decision regarding vaccine. Yeah, Thank you so great. much, Dr. Merlin. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. It was a pleasure to speak with everybody.